Section 14 of Poems of American History, Volume 3, The Period of Growth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6, 14 Years of Peace. In his message to Congress at the opening of the December session of 1847, President Polk recommended, among other things, the construction of a ship canal across the Isthmus of Panama, a recommendation which was not to bear fruit for 60 years. The Ship Canal from the Atlantic to the Pacific an ode to the American people and their Congress on reading the message of the United States President in December 1847. Rend America asunder, and unite the binding sea that emboldens man and tempers, make the ocean free. Break the bolt that bars the passage, that our river richly pours western wealth to western nations, let that sea be ours. Ours by all the hardy whalers, by the pointing Oregon, by the western peld and working, unthralled Saxon sun. Long indeed they have been wooing the Pacific and his bride. Now tis time for holy wedding. Join them by the tide. Have the snowy serfs not struggled many centuries in vain that their lips might seal the union? Lock them, main to main. When the mighty God of nature made this favored continent, he allowed it yet unsevered that a race be sent, able, mindful of his purpose, prone to people to subdue and to bind the land with iron or to force it through. With the prophet navigator seeking straits to his Cataeus, but began now consummate it, make the strait and pass. Blessed the eyes that shall behold it, when the pointing boom shall veer, leading through the parted Andes, while the nations cheer. There at Suez, Europe's mattock cuts the briny road with skill, and must Darien bid defiance to the pilot still? Do we breathe this breath of knowledge purely to enjoy its zest? Shall the iron arm of science like a sluggard rest? Up then, at it, earnest people, bravely wrought thy scorning blade, but there's fresher fame in store yet glory for the spade what we want is not in envy and for all we pioneer let the keels of every nation through the isthmus steer must the globe be always girded ere we get to brahma's priest take the tissues of your lowells westward to the east ye that vanquish pain in distance ye in meshing time with wire court ye patiently for ever yon antarctic ire Shall the mariner forever double the impending capes, while his longsome and retracing needless course he shapes? What was daring for our fathers to defy those billows fierce is but tame for their descendants we are bid to pierce. Ye that fight with printing armies, settle sons on forlong track, as the Romans flung their eagles but to win them back. Who undoubting worship boldness, and if baffled, bolder rise? Shall we lag when grandeur beckons to this good emprise? Let the vastness not appall us. Greatness is thy destiny. Let the doubters not recall us. Venture suits the free. Like a seer, I see her throning. Windland strong in freedom's health. Warding peace on both the waters. Widest commonwealth. Crowned with wreaths that still grow greener. Guerdon for untiring pain. For the wise, the stout, and steadfast. Rend the land in twain. Cleave America asunder. This is worthy work for thee. Hark, the seas roll up imploring. Make the ocean free. Francis Lieber The famine in Ireland in 1847 awakened much sympathy in the United States, and the ship Jamestown, laden with food, was dispatched to Cork, making a remarkably quick passage. The Worship of Peace, 1847 Sweet land of song, Thy harp doth hang upon the willow now, While famine's blight and fever's pang Stamps misery on thy brow. Yet take thy harp and raise thy voice, Though weak and low it be, And let thy sinking heart rejoice In friends still left to thee. Look out, look out, across the sea That girds thy emerald shore. A ship of war is bound to thee, But with no warlike store. Her thunders sleep, tis mercy's breath That wafts her over the sea. She goes not forth to deal out death, but bears new life to thee. Thy wasted hands can scarcely strike the chords of grateful praise. Thy plaintive tone is now unlike the voice of prouder days. Yet even in sorrow, tuneful still, let Erin's voice proclaim. In bardic praise on every hill, Columbia's glorious name. 
Samuel Lover. On June 8, 1848, Henry Clay was defeated by Zachary Taylor for the Whig nomination for the presidency. On the defeat of Henry Clay, June 8, 1848. Fallen, how fallen, states and empires fall, over towers and rock-built walls and perished nations, floods to tempest call, with hollow sound along the sea of time. The great man never falls, he lives, he towers aloft, he stands sublime. They fall who give him not the honor here that suits his future name, they die and are forgot. O giant, loud and blind, the great man's fame is his own shadow and not cast by thee, a shadow that shall grow, as down the heaven of time the sun descends, and on the world shall throw his godlike image till it sinks where blends time's dim horizon with eternity. William Wilberforce Lord Margaret Fuller Ossoli, her husband, the Marquis Ossoli, and their child were drowned off Fire Island July 16, 1850, while returning from Europe in the ship Elizabeth. The ship was driven ashore in a storm and broken up by the waves. On the death of Marquis de Ossoli and his wife, Margaret Fuller, July 16, 1850. Over his millions death has lawful power, but over thee, brave de Ossoli, none, none. After a longer struggle in a fight, worthy of Italy, to youth restored, thou far from home, art sunk beneath the surge of the Atlantic, on its shore, in reach of help, in trust of refuge, sunk with all precious on earth to thee, a child, a wife. Proud as the word of her, America is prouder, showing to her sons how high swells woman's courage in a virtuous breast. She would not leave behind her those she loved. Such solitary safety might become others, not her. Not her who stood beside the pallet of the wounded, and when the worst of France and perfidy assailed the walls of unsuspicious Rome. Rest, glorious soul, renowned for the strength of genius, Margaret. Rest with the twain too, dear. My words are few, and shortly none will hear my failing voice, but the same language with more full appeal shall hail thee. Many are the sons of song whom thou hast heard upon thy native plains, worthy to sing of thee the hour is come. Take we our seats and let the dirge begin. Walter Savage Landor The following verses from Punch described various events of 1851, the winning of the international yacht race by the America, the project for the canal across the isthmus, and comment upon the ingenuity of some Yankee inventions. The last appendix to Yankee Doodle, Punch, 1851. Yankee Doodle sent to town his goods for exhibition. Everybody ran him down and laughed at his position. They thought him all the world behind, a goony muff or a noodle. Laugh on, good people, never mind, says quiet Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy, mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. Yankee Doodle had a craft, a rather tidy clipper, and he challenged while they laughed the Britishers to whip her. Their whole yacht squadron she outsped, and that on their own water. Of all the lot she went ahead, and they came nowhere otter. Or Panama there was a scheme, long talked of to pursue a short route which many thought a dream, by Lake Nicaragua. John Bull discussed the plan on foot with slow irresolution, while Yankee Doodle went and put it into execution. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy, mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. A steamer of the Collins line, a Yankee Doodle's notion, has also quickest cut the brine across the Atlantic Ocean, and British agents, no way slow her merits to discover, have been and bought her just to tow the cunnard packets over. Your gunsmiths of their skill may crack, but that again don't mention. I guess that Colt's revolvers whack their very first invention. By Yankee Doodle, to your beat, downright in agriculture, with his machine for reaping wheat, chawed up as by a vulture. You also fancied in your pride, which truly is tarnation, them British locks of yarn defied, the rogues of all creation. But Chubbs and Brahmas, Hobbs is picked, and you must now be viewed all as having been completely licked by glorious Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. Daniel Webster, died October 24, 1852. 
when life hath run its largest round of toil and triumph joy and woe how brief a storied page is found to compass all its outward show the world-tried sailor tires and droops his flag is rent his keel forgot his farthest voyages seem but loops that float from life's entangled knot but when within the narrow space some larger soul hath lived and wrought whose sight was opened to embrace the boundless realms of deed and thought when stricken by the freezing blast a nation's living pillars fall how rich the storied page how vast a word a whisper can recall no metal lifts its fretted face nor speaking marble cheats your eye yet while these pictured lines i trace a living image passes by a roof beneath the mountain pines the cloisters of a hill-girt plain the front of life's embattled lines a mound beside the heaving main these are the scenes a boy appears set life's round dial in the sun count the swift arc of seventy years his frame is dust his task is done yet pause upon the noontide hour ere the declining sun has laid his bleaching rays on manhood's power and look upon the mighty shade no gloom that stately shape can hide no change uncrown his brow behold dark calm large fronted lightning eyed earth has no double from its mould ere from the fields by valor won the battle smoke had rolled away and bared the blood-red setting sun his eyes were opened on that day his land was but a shelving strip black with the strife that made it free he lived to see its banners dip their fringes in the western sea the boundless prairies learned his name his words the mountain echoes knew the northern breezes swept his fame from icy lake to warm bayou in toil he lived in peace he died when life's full cycle was complete put off his robes of power and pride and laid them at his master's feet his rest is by the storm-swept waves whom life's wild tempests roughly tried whose heart was like the streaming caves of ocean throbbing at his side death's cold white hand is like the snow laid softly on the furrowed hill it hides the broken seams below and leaves the summit brighter still in vain the envious tongue upbraids his name a nation's heart shall keep till morning's latest sunlight fades on the blue tablet of the deep oliver wendell holmes in 1854, a survey was ordered of the Isthmus of Darien, and Lieutenant Isaac G. Strain was placed in charge of the work. His party was reduced to great extremities in crossing the Isthmus, but bore their sufferings with a heroism seldom surpassed. The Flag, an Incident of Strain's Expedition, 1854 I never have got the bearings quite, though I followed the course for many a year, if he was crazy, clean outright, or only what you might say was queer. He was just a simple sailor man, I minded as well as yesterday, when we messed aboard the old Cayenne, Lord, how the time does slip away. That was five and thirty year ago, and I never expect such times again, for sailors wasn't afraid to stow themselves on a Yankee vessel then. He was only a sort of bosom's mate, but every inch of him taut and trim, stars and anchors and togs of state tailors don't build for the like of him he flew a no-account sort of name a regular fo'castle jim or jack with a plain mcginnis abaft the same gingerly reefed to simple mac mac we allowed was sort of queer ballast or compass wasn't right till he flicked four juicers one day a fear prevailed that he hadn't learned to fight but i reckon the captain knowed his man when he put the flag in his hand the day that we went ashore from the old cayenne on a madman's cruise for darien bay forty days in the wilderness we toiled and suffered and starved with strain losing the number of many a mess in the devil's swamps of the spanish main all of us starved and many died one laid down in his dull despair his stronger messmate went to his side we left them both in the jungle there it was hard to part with shipmates so but standing by would have done no good we heard them moaning all day so slow we dragged along through the weary wood mcginnis he suffered the worst of all not that he ever piped his eye or wouldn't have answered to the call if they sounded it for all hands to die i guess twould have sounded for him before but the grit inside of him kept strong till we met relief on the river shore and we all broke down when it came along 
all but McGinnis, gaunt and tall, touching his hat and standing square, captained the flag, and that was all. He just keeled over and foundered there. The flag, we thought, he had lost his head. It mightn't be much to lose at best, till we came by and by to dig his bed, and we found it folded around his breast. He laid so calm and smiling there, with the flag wrapped tight around his heart. Maybe he saw his course all fair, only we couldn't read the chart. James Jeffrey Roach On February 16, 1857, Alicia Kent Kane, explorer of the Arctic, died at Havana, Cuba, whither he had gone in the hope of regaining a health shattered by his sufferings in the north. Kane Aloft upon an old basaltic crag, which, scalped by keen winds that defend the pole, gazes with dead face on the seas that roll around the secret of the mystic zone, a mighty nation's star-bespangled flag flutters alone, and underneath upon the lifeless front of that drear cliff a simple name is traced, fit type of him whom famishing and gaunt, but with a rocky purpose in his soul, breasted the gathering snows, clung to the drifting flows, by want beleaguered and by winter chased, seeking the brother lost amid that frozen waste. Not many months ago we greeted him, crowned with the icy honors of the north. Across the land his hard-won fame went forth, and Maine's deep wounds were shaken limb by limb. His own mild keystone state, sedate and prim, burst from decorous quiet as he came. Hot southern lips with eloquence aflame sounded his triumph. Texas, wild and grim, preferred its horny hand, the large lung west, from out its giant breast yelled its frank welcome, and from main to main, jubilant to the sky, thundered the mighty cry, Honor to Cain. In vain, in vain beneath his feet we flung, the reddening roses, all in vain we poured, the golden wine and round the shining board, sent the toast circling till the rafters rung, with the thrice tripled honors of the feast, scarce the buds wilted and the voices ceased, ere the pure light that sparkled in his eyes, bright as the oral fires in southern skies, faded and faded and the brave young heart that the relentless arctic winds had robbed of all its vital heat in that long quest for the lost captain now within his breast more and more faintly throbbed his was the victory but as his grasp closed on the laurel crown with eager clasp death launched a whistling dart and ere the thunders of applause were done his bright eyes closed forever on the sun too late, too late, the splendid prize he won, in the Olympic race of science and of art, like to some shattered berg that pale and lone, drifts from the white north to a tropic zone, and in the burning day, wastes peak by peak away, till on some rosy even, it dies with sunlight blessing it, so he tranquilly floated to a southern sea, and melted into heaven. He needs no tears who lived a noble life, we will not weep for him who died so well, but we will gather round the hearth and tell the story of his strife. Such homage suits him well, better than funeral pomp or passing bell. What tale of peril and self-sacrifice, prisoned amid the fastness of ice, with hunger howling o'er the wastes of snow, night lengthening into months the ravenous flow, crunching the massive ships as the white bear crunches his prey, the insufficient share of loathsome food, the lethargy of famine, the despair, urging to labor, nervelessly pursued, toil done with skinny arms and faces hued like pallid masks while dofully behind glimmered the fading embers of a mind. That awful hour, when through the prostrate band, delirium stalked, laying his burning hand upon the ghastly foreheads of the crew, the whispers of rebellion faint and few, at first, but deepening ever still they grew, into black thoughts of murder, such the throng of horrors bound the hero, high the song, should be that hymns the noble part he played, sinking himself, yet ministering aid, to all around him by a mighty will, living defiant, of the wants that kill. Because his death would seal his comrades' fate, cheering with ceaseless and inventive skill those polar waters dark and desolate, equal to every trial, every fate, he stands until spring, tardy with relief, unlocks the icy gate. And the pale prisoners thread the world once more to the steep cliffs of Greenland's pastoral shore, bearing their dying chief. Time was when he should gain his spurs of gold from royal hands who wooed the knightly state. The knell of old formalities is told, and the world's knights are now self-consecrate. No grander episode doth chivalry hold. 
in all its annals back to Charlemagne, then that lone vigil of unceasing pain, faithfully kept through hunger and through cold by the good Christian knight, Alicia Kane. Fitz James O'Brien. On September 12, 1857, the Central America was lost at sea in a great storm off Cape Hatteras. Captain William Lewis Herndon of the Navy was in command. His tranquil courage preserved discipline up to the last and until his passengers, officers, and crew were all in the boats. Seeing that the last boat was already overloaded, Captain Herndon refused to add to its danger and, ordering it off, went down with his ship. Herndon, September 12, 1857. I shout and rave, thou cruel sea, in triumph over that fated deck. Grown holy by another grave, thou hast the captain of the wreck. No prayer was said, no lesson read, over him the soldier of the sea, and yet for him through all the land a thousand thoughts to night shall be. And many an eye shall dim with tears, and many a cheek be flushed with pride, and men shall say there died a man, and boys shall learn how well he died. I weep for him whose noble soul is with the God who made it great, but weep not for so proud a death, we could not spare so grand a fate. Nor could humanity resign that hour which bade her heart beat high, and blaze in duty stainless shield, and set a star in honor's sky. O oh, dreary night, O oh, grave of hope, O oh, sea and dark unpitying sky, full many a wreck these waves shall claim, ere such another heart shall die. Alas, how can we help but mourn when hero bosoms yield their breath? A century itself may bear but once the flower of such a death. So full of manliness, so sweet, with utmost duty nobly done, so thronged with deeds, so filled with life, as though with death that life begun. It has begun, true gentleman, no better life we ask for thee. Thy viking soul and woman heart forever shall a beacon be. A starry thought to veering souls, to teach it is not best to live, to show that life has not to match such knighthood as the grave can give. Silas Wire Mitchell In 1857, Commodore Josiah Tottenell was appointed flag officer of the Asiatic Station and, finding China at war with the Allied English and French fleets, went to the scene of operations at Pai Ho. Just before an engagement, his flagship grounded and was towed off by the English boats, and when he saw the English in trouble shortly afterwards, he sailed into their assistance, exclaiming, Blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. June 25th, 1859. Ebbed and flowed the muddy Pai Ho by the Gulf of Pechali. Near its waters swung the yellow dragon flag. Past the batteries of China looking westward we could see lazy junks along the lazy river lag. Villagers in nearby Takao toiled beneath their humble star. On the flats the ugly mud fort lay and dreamed, while the Powhatan swung slowly at her station by the bar, while the Toewan with Tatnau onward steamed. Lazy east and lazy river, fort of mud in lazy June. English gunboats through the water slowly fare, with the dragon flag scarce moving in the lazy afternoon, over the mud heap storing venom in the glare. We were on our way to Peking, to the Son of Heaven's throne. White with peace was all our mission to this court. Peaceful, too, the English vessels on the turbine steam bestrown, seeking passage up the Pai Ho past the fort. By the bar lay half the English, while the rest, with gallant hope, wrestled with the slipping ebb tide up the stream. They had cleared the Chinese irons, reached the double chain and rope, where the ugly mud forts scowled upon their beam. Boom! The heavens split asunder with the thunder of the fight, as the hateful dragon made its faith a mock. Every cannon spat its perfidy, each casemate blazed its spite, crashing down upon the English shock on shock. In his courage, Rayson perished, brave McKenna fought and fell. Scores were dying as they lived like valiant men. And the meteor flag that upward prayed to heaven from that hell, wet below for those who never should weep again. Far away the English launches near the Powhatan swung slow. All despairing, useless, out of reach of war, knew their comrades in the battle, felt them reel beneath the blow, lying helpless against the ebb tide by the bar. On the Toewan stood Tattnall, Stephen Trenchard by his side. Old man Tattnall, who he dared at Veracruz, saw her crippled by the cannon, saw there throttled by the tide. Men of English blood and speech, could he refuse? 
I'll be damned, says he to Trenchard, if old Tattnall standing by, seeing white men butchered here by such a foe. Where's my barge? No sidearms, mind you. See those English fight and die. Blood is thicker, sir, than water. Let us go. Quick we man the boat and quicker plunge into that devil's brew. An official call, and Tattnall went in state. Trenchard's hurt, our flag and ribbons and the rocking barge shot through. Heart, our coxswain dies beneath the Chinese hate. But the cheers those English give us as we gain their admiral's ship make the shattered boat and weary arms seem light. Then the rare smile from old Tattnall and hope's hearty word and grip, lying wounded, bleeding, brave in hell's despite. Tattnall nods and we go forward, find a gun no longer fought. What is peace to us when all its crew lie dead? One bright English lad brings powder and a wounded man the shot, and we scotch that Chinese dragon tail and head. Hands are shaken, faith is plighted, sounds our captain's cheery call. In a British boat we speed us fast and far, and the towy wan and Tottenall down the ebb tide slide and fall, to the launches lying moaning by the bar. Eager for an English vengeance, battle light on every face, see the clustered stars lead on the triple cross, cheering, swinging into action, valiant hope takes heart of grace, from the cannon's cloudy roar the lanyards toss. How they fought, those fighting English, how they cheered the towy wan, cheered our sailors, cheered old Tattnall, grim and gray, and the cheers ring down the ages as they rang beneath the sun, over those bubbling troubled waters far away. Ebbs and flows the muddy Paiho by the Gulf of Petchley, idly floats beside the stream the dragon flag, past the batteries of China looking westward till you see lazy junks along the lazy river lag. Let the long, long years drip slowly on that lost and ancient land. Ever dear one seen to hearts of gallant men, there's a hand clasp and a heart throb, there's a word we understand. Blood is thicker, sir, than water, now as then. Wallace Rice in the fall of 1860, the Prince of Wales, traveling as Baron Renfrew, paid a visit to the United States, lasting from September 21st to October 20th. He was the recipient of many attentions, and a great ball was given in his honor at the Academy of Music in New York City. While the ball was in progress, a portion of the floor gave way, but no one was injured. Baron Renfrew's Ball, October 1860 "'Twas a grand display was the prince's ball, a pageant or feat or what you may call, a brilliant coruscation where ladies and knights of noble worth enchanted a prince of royal birth by a royal demonstration. Like queens arrayed in their regal guise, they charmed the prince with dazzling eyes, fair ladies of rank and station, till the floor gave way and down they sprawled in a tableau style which the artists called a floor-all decoration." At the prince's feet, like flowers, they were laid in the brightest bouquet ever made for a prince's choice to falter, perplexed to find where all were rare, which was the fairest of the fair, to cull for a queenly altar. But soon the floor was set aright, and Peter Cooper's face grew bright, when, like the swell of an organ, all hearts beat time to the first quadrille, and the prince confessed to a joyous thrill as he danced with Mrs. Morgan. Then came the waltz the prince's own, and every bar and brilliant tone had music's sweetest grace on. But the prince himself never felt his charm till he slightly clasped the circling arm, that lovely girl, Miss Mason. But ah, the work went bravely on, and meek-eyed peace a trophy won by the magic art of the dancers, for the daring prince's next exploit was to league with Scott's Camellia Hoyt and overcome the Lancers. Besides these three he deigned to yield his hand to Mrs. M. B. Field, Miss J. and Miss Van Buren. Miss Russell, too, was given a place, all beauties famous for their grace, from Texas to Lake Huron. With Mrs. Kernachan he lanced, with Mrs. Edward Cooper danced, with Mrs. Belmont capered, with fair Miss Fish and fairy rig he tripped a sort of royal jig, and next Miss Butler favored. And thus, mid many hopes and fears, by the brilliant light of the chandeliers, did they gaily quaff and revel, well pleased to charm a royal prince, the only one from old England since, George Washington was a rebel. And so the fleeting hours went by, and watches stopped, lest time should fly. Or that they winding wanted, old matrons dozed, and papas smiled, and many a fair was once beguiled, as the prince danced on, undaunted. "'Tis now a dream, the prince's ball, its vanished glories one and all, the scenes of the fairy tales, 
for Cinderella herself was there, and Barnum keeps for trial fair the beautiful slipper deposited there by His Highness, the Prince of Wales. Charles Graham Halpine. End of section 14. End of Poems of American History, Volume 3, The Period of Growth by Various.